Hey, what's going on, guys? Ever since I read Earth X, I've been weirdly obsessed with it. Like, I am not bullshitting or making a mountain out of a molehill when I say that Earth X by Jim Kruger and the late great John Paul Leon is, without a shadow of a doubt, one of, if not the, most important comics Marvel has ever published. And all things being what they are, when I say important, I mean important within the context of the publication history of Marvel Comics. It's not going to bring about world peace or solve the mystery of what lies beyond the void of death, but as far as Marvel Comics are concerned, this book is like really important if you're a Marvel fan. Which is why it's so weird that whenever people talk about the greatest Marvel comics ever told, it's always Infinity Gauntlet, it's always Kraven's Last Hunt, it's always the death of Captain Marvel, or X-Men God Loves Man Kills, or the coming of Galactus, or the Ultimates, or Age of Apocalypse, or whatever has Jonathan Hickman's name on it. And to be fair, those are all key foundational books within the Marvel Legacy. But nobody brings up Earth X, which after having read it, I don't know why. Just on a superficial level, everything Marvel has published and even adapted to film and TV and video games over the past 25 odd years has come directly from Earth X. Gender Bent Thor, Earth X. Cyclops leading the X Men after the death of Charles Xavier, Earth X. The Earth being an incubation egg for a baby celestial, Earth X. Clea taking over as the Sorcerer Supreme after the death of Doctor Strange, Earth X. Black Bolt activating a Terrigen bomb and mutating the population of Earth, giving everyone superpowers, Earth X. The Watcher being blinded and ultimately replaced, Earth X. Storm and Black Panther getting married. Earth X. Granted, none of these events play out one for one, but like, this comic has clearly been mined for ideas. In other words, if Earth X was a cow, it would be skin and bones in the milking chambers of Marvel's Idea Dungeon. So just on principle, I feel like this book should be held in the same company as like, Dark Knight Returns, and how influential that was on the DC Universe, for better or worse, or Kingdom Come, again, for better or worse. Which is actually funny, because Earth X starts out as a weird, fan-fueled reaction to Kingdom Come, because after DC released Kingdom Come, people were asking Alex Ross to make character designs for a dark future Marvel timeline inspired by Kingdom Come, which he did. And then Marvel hired Jim Kruger, John Paul Leon, Bill Reinhold, Tom Klein, Matt Hollingsworth, Melissa Edwards, and James Sinclair to basically just make Marvel's Kingdom Come. And they did. And it turned out pretty great. In fact, I'd say it turned out better than Kingdom Come, which Honestly, isn't that hard to do because this is actually good. Why you me? I'm right. So, as for the story itself, I mean, I've already spoiled all of the major plot reveals and stuff, but without context, none of it really makes any sense. So, Earth X takes place in a distant ish future. Like, okay, Peter Parker is a middle aged man and his daughter Mayday is in her late teens. So, that should give you a rough idea as to how old everyone else in the Marvel Universe would be. And the entire book, very similar to Kingdom Come, is presented through the eyes of an omniscient narrator. In this case, it's both Machine Man and The Watcher. And their dynamic is very interesting, because Machine Man is just trying to live a normal life, LARPing as a human being under his alias as Aaron Stack, and Uatu transports Aaron to the blue side of the moon in this very 2001 A Space Odyssey style sequence, which may or may not have been an intentional creative choice, because after all, Jack Kirby did the comic book adaptation of 2001 in like the mid-70s? 
Regardless, Uatu brings Eren to the moon to essentially become the new Watcher. Because Uatu can't watch a damn thing because he got his eyes ripped out of his face. And most of this book is just Eren observing and telling Uatu what he sees, both past and present. And this is where I feel like Earth-X is not only the perfect Marvel comic to give somebody who's just getting into Marvel comics, be it from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or the myriad of video games, or AO3 erotic fan fiction, because it gives you such an in-depth history of the Marvel Universe. But it also serves as the perfect conclusion to the Marvel Universe as conceived by Jack Kirby, Steve Ditko, Bill Everett, Stan Lee, and everybody else in the original Marvel bullpen. And Jim Kruger has such a command over the history and continuity of Marvel Comics that it's interesting seeing how he deconstructs and inverts a lot of classic characters and staples in the Marvel Universe. Like I said, we pick up in a world where everyone on Earth has superpowers, that's the main status quo, but Aaron switches between stories and he's checking in on everyone in the Marvel Universe. Uh, the Fantastic Four have broken up after the death of Johnny Storm and Sue Storm, who both died killing Doctor Doom. Uh, ben Grimm is retired and now has kids with Alicia Masters, who thankfully didn't die in a rock slide, but instead, due to her powers, was able to create children out of clay because she can bring clay to life. Uh, meanwhile, Reed is sulking around Doctor Doom's castle, wearing Doom's armor, and he feels guilty because he thinks that a machine that he built caused humanity's collective mutation, which I guess I spoiled that he's ultimately proven wrong, but the way in which he gets to that discovery is really interesting. The Inhumans have returned to Earth for a royal wedding, one supposedly so important that it'll unite humanity and inhumanity in a new golden age. Which, I'm not gonna lie, I thought was really boring at first. But the way it's handled in the end is actually really well. And that's one of the things that I don't want to spoil. Uh, I feel like you should just read that for yourself. Um, most of the Avengers are dead and they've been replaced by synthoid replicants designed by Tony Stark. And Tony himself is a recluse who's hiding away in a quarantine facility because he doesn't want to get infected with superpowers. Um, and I think Jim Kruger's take on Tony Stark is very fascinating because he's very protective of his own humanity despite having no problem perverting the memory of his dead friends and turning them into robots and living among a mechanical memory of once was and what he's lost? I don't know. Maybe I'm looking too deep into things with this, but I like Iron Man. I'm gonna overanalyze anything done with that character. I just can't help myself. Meanwhile, Captain America is Bruce Willis. And he's running around in the tattered remains of a loincloth fashioned out of the American flag. And he's got beef with this 14-year-old telepathic 4chan neo-Nazi who is the new Red Skull. And his design is fantastic. He's wearing this, like, red Punisher t-shirt. It is the perfect design for this character. And he's such a horrific little shit. His name is Ben Beckley. He's a fucking nightmare. Apparently, he killed every other telepath on Earth. And when his parents forced him into therapy with Doc Samson, he made Doc Samson turn himself inside out and he dies like halfway through. Like, this kid is probably one of the most disturbing and effective supervillains that Marvel's ever created. And speaking of, of all the character alterations and status quos that are ripped from this book for the main Marvel timeline, I don't know why nobody's done anything with Ben Beckley. I just, I feel like it's a missed opportunity. That's all I'm saying. He's a really cool character. Also, the whole concept of Captain America being draped in the ruins of the American flag while having the letter A carved into his forehead, just that alone is metal as fuck. But when you consider that he's reached that point after rejecting a unanimous call to be the president of the United States, 
only for the American people to vote into office Norman Osborn, who then appoints the Sinister Six and the Enforcers as his cabinet, the Captain America design takes on a whole new meaning. And there's a lot of other stuff here, too. I've just barely scratched the surface with this book. I haven't even talked about Mayday Parker as Venom or Daredevil being an immortal sadomasochist with the powers of Ghost Rider, but these are all things that are explored in the comic that I think you should read for yourself. Because no amount of me describing it, in my honest opinion, does any justice to how the book actually reads. Like, Earth X is an epic in every sense of the word. Now, okay, granted, I don't want to hype this book up to an impossible standard, uh, keeping it a buck. It is a very difficult thing to get into. It's 14 issues long, and you can definitely feel those 14 issues, especially in the first third of the book. And like I said earlier, or at least I, I think I said earlier, I don't remember, but if I didn't, the way this book jumps around between various storylines... It all feels very random, and it's very easy to lose you, but I promise, it all comes together in the end. And again, it's just epic, but epic in that classic Marvel kind of way, specifically in that old school Jack Kirby kind of way. It's not epic in the way DC Comics is epic. It's not operatic, it's not a melodrama, it's epic in like a sci-fi horror kind of way. Like in the way a lot of classic Fantastic Four or classic Avengers is epic. There's a real gritty tangibility to the immediate human threat and the human drama. And then everything culminates in this metaphysical horror that dwarfs the human condition and then renders all of that tangible human struggle completely meaningless. Because that's when the Celestials show up, and I, I love how John Paul Leone and Bill Reinhold depict the Celestials as these silhouettes of mechanical light in the void of space. The heavy inks and the scale to which they're depicted, it's giving Kubrick vibes, which again, feels intentional. Especially with that opening with Machine Man mirroring the scene from 2001 where Dave enters the Stargate. Again, it's epic in that classic Marvel Comics cosmic horror kind of way. And I stress that because, I guess, in reading a lot of contemporary Marvel Comics, there is a difference in terms of style and tone. Uh, Marvel is very much in this post-cinematic irreverent action Saturday morning cartoon kind of era which I've often described as making them feel like a baby DC or a DC Comics Jr. Uh, Marvel Comics right now feels very much like classic DC Comics uh, which isn't a completely bad thing. These companies over the decades make creative shifts. DC's done it several times over these past 80 years but something definitely changed somewhere along the lines of the late 90s into the early 2000s with Marvel. And that's really when the main 616 Marvel Universe makes that creative shift into being DC Jr. Because the Ultimate Universe, I feel, is very much harkening back to that classic Marvel tone and style, just in a far more post-9-11, post-MTV kind of way. And while the Ultimate Universe retained that classic Marvel tone, the main Marvel Universe sort of drifted off into this new quirky era that we're in, which I've seen a lot of people complain about, you know, the modern Marvel, but that's all just very silly to me. Like, where Marvel is today did not start in 2015. It started 20 years ago. You just weren't paying attention, but I digress. The point is, reading this was very jarring, because it's so distinctly written and drawn in the tone and style of classic Marvel comics, and in a weird way, it's oddly fitting that it serves as the conclusion 
to the Marvel Universe as envisioned by Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko and all those guys, especially considering it came out in the late 90s when Marvel was starting to make that creative and stylistic shift away from where they originated. I just think that's all very fascinating. But Earth-X is amazing. If you are a Marvel fan, I can't recommend this highly enough. Again, for the life of me, I don't know how or why this book has managed to fly under the radar for so many years. And it's funny, because Jim Kruger is 3 for 3 in that regard. There's Earth-X, but there's also Justice, which he also worked on with Alex Ross. It is literally the perfect Justice League story. Like, everybody talks about New Frontier and Infinite Crisis and Rock of Ages, and those are all legitimately amazing stories, but if you read Justice, you'll see what I'm talking about. It's the quintessential Justice League story, and nobody talks about it. It's the most bizarre thing in the world. And then there's Project Superpowers, which Jim Kruger, again, worked on with Alex Ross and uh, Doug Klauba, I think. That's another one that's really good that nobody talks about. But in all honesty, that's a book that was also just too far ahead of its time. You know, I feel like if it came out just 10 years later, when the MCU was the cream of the crop of the Hollywood slop, and every shitbag cokehead producer was trying to make their Marvel Cinematic Universe with Blackjack and hookers, I feel like Project Superpowers would have been a bigger deal. But, I don't know. I just think it's hilarious that Jim Kruger has written arguably some of the greatest superhero comics of all time, and nobody's heard of them. Or at the very least, nobody talks about them. Anyway, read EarthX if you haven't read it already. If you have, what do you think about it? Am I crazy for thinking that it's one of the greatest Marvel comics of all time? I don't know. What do you think? Let me know down below in the comment section. Also, if you like this video, hit the like button, share, support the channel. And if you want to see more content like this, all you have to do is subscribe. I'm the Mystical Green Beanie. Thank you for watching. And as always, until next time, adios. Take care.